mother was Jessie de la Cruz. She was a woman who always spoke her mind. Her life became part of La Causa. She genuinely cared about the farm's workers' plight and hated seeing men and women in poor health. Farm work was hard, and she knew that workers needed to be well fed. So, she started cooking for Rey Chavarria, a restaurant owner in Huron. My mom was a great cook. She became an entrepreneur, started a business preparing lunches for the braceros. She had to work because there was a lot of competition for agricultural work. The growers were bringing in men from Mexico who would work for less money. So, she had this tiny kitchen and she would roll out dozens of tortillas and she made taquitos with shredded beef and fried papas. Mm. Man, I miss those. Me and my brothers and sisters and parents were living in a Quonset hut in Huron. One day, when I was a kid, she and my dad had to go together to a Louis King market in West Fresno to get groceries. Well, a sandstorm struck. I will never forget the sun and the sky disappearing in minutes. My dad lost all sense of direction driving home. The sand had wiped away the lines in the street. By the time my parents made it home, me and my sister Virginia were nearly buried in sand. We were hiding under the bed when my mom found us almost completely covered in sand. From that day on, my mom promised herself never to leave her children alone again. So, we always tagged alone. That's how I became part of the movimiento. We lived in Kirkran. That's where I was born. My dad used to work out in the fields, and I guess my mom did too. There was 11 of us, and we went to public school. My dad worked in the cotton fields. I was probably about 11 or 12, and you're supposed to have permission to work at the age of 13, and I wasn't quite 13 years. I had to go to work to help support the family. I was the fifth one, right in the middle. My mom and dad always worked, so we always had to help out because there were so many of us. I remember coming home from school and we had to make tortillas. We pitched in, clean house, make dinner by the time mom and dad came home from work. I remember I said to my mom that it was getting just too much for me. And she said, okay, the boys will help you. So I would make dinner and they would have to clean the kitchen and make their own beds and she gave the girls something to do. So it would be each one of us with chores. My older brother, Albert, he was like the father figure in the house. And my older brothers would come raising heck. And then he would come and raise even bigger heck in the house. They all needed to help and they knew it. And they did. The word huelga means to strike, but Chavez remarked that it means more to the Mexican worker. One individual told me huelga means to revolt. Our Buo translator advises that the word huelga means to strike or to get out. We were picking plums. We were nine children, <laughs> a big family. The saludados. Our father was an irrigator and we were migrant workers. Our parents took us to all those places to pick plums. Santa Rosa. Yuba City. Healdsburg. It was hard for us. We were living in the camps. Tin shacks. No running water. So many people. They came from Arabia or Filipinos. And then the Bracero program came. There's a harvest! Plums! It's so hot. Temperature a hundred. Higher than that. And there's no water. No toilets. And we went to this ranch. It was close to the river. 
We picked plums for over two hours and then to the river. We ran to the river. We ran and got wet and screamed and played. But then it was time to come and pick plums. Our daddy looked at us. We were scared. <laughs> then he swings open his arms and a smile as big as the sun shines on his face. We were so happy. He always gave us moral support. We were just like thousands of other families. Migrant, you know, just following the crops wherever they were. We were a big family. Four brothers, two sisters, all of them worked in the fields. Both my mom and dad were from Mexico, yeah? They came here at a very early age. They got married over there and soon afterwards they migrated. Arrived in El Paso with seven cents in their pockets and hungry. They came first to Brawley, California and they worked in the carrots. My dad worked in the railroad gang. Different jobs, you know. We stayed pretty much in the Central Valley and we worked many, many years there. I was working for Shinley Wine Industries. It's a big corporation. And when I left Shinley, that's when the strike started there. Shinley was one of the first ranches, corporations that the unions hit. The idea was to hit the biggest first, you know. 1964 or 65, you know, people were passing out leaflets, telling farm workers about the coming strike and that they should join and things like that, you know. And I used to collect those leaflets and read them, but I didn't pay too much attention to them. I mean, back in those years, I was young and the thing to do was to go to a bar and drink beer, you know. <laughs> but I used to keep those leaflets. I came to find out that my daughter, Helen, had already joined the strikers and she didn't want to tell me because she was worried I would get mad, you know? Anyway, the day came when I found out. It made me sit up and take notice, you know? She was giving me hints, you know, to, to sign up, but I still wouldn't do it. Finally, I decided to join the union. And what made me change my mind really was remembering all those things, you know? How they used to treat my dad, the labor contractors and the growers. So I decided that I should join up and help out. You know, I've always felt that if you have a problem, you know, you gotta get up and fight. Otherwise, you're gonna keep doing it over and over again to you all the time. So they started telling me, you know, and explaining to me how the union worked and, and what would eventually happen. And I liked it. I liked it. I liked it. One year, we were chopping sugar beets in the winter time. Oh, that sugar beet, I didn't like it. That was the hardest thing in my life. You get this short-handed hoe, chop it straight bent over. It was so hard for me. I was crying, my feet, they were so blistered up, it was coming up blood. The labor contractor told my daddy, if she doesn't get in the wage line, she's not gonna get paid. She has to come and stand in the line. And I couldn't make it up myself because it was so hard for me. That little bastard. I told my daddy, can't he give you the money for me? No. You have to come. I'll hold you up. He took me over there and got my pay. It took us three days to finish the corner they gave us. 32 rows. And how much did they pay us? Nine dollars. Nine dollars for all. My dad, my sister, and me. I'll never forget how sad my daddy was that day. We worked till three o'clock in the morning till about five o'clock that afternoon. Every day, we do something. <sighs> the only relief from all of that backbreaking work was Saturday night dances hey. in Delano. <laughs> it was one Saturday in April, 1964. Our padre took us to Leandro Gutierrez's house for a house meeting. Vamos a tener unión. Vamos a hacer esto. It was being organized by Cesar Chavez. It was like a big dream. I liked the dream because I felt like all my body had those words that he said. We are the workers. We make and raise the food for our country. And we are paid less and we live on less than anybody. Why? We needed to do something. And it was so quiet, so slow, like every word he said was so strong. 
Our dad always believed in the union because I think his father was in a big strike in Arizona. The union is the best for people. The next 18 months, we kept working and paying our dues to the National Farm Workers Association. We didn't know if any good was going to come out of it, but we kept on attending house meetings and our commitment grew. I stopped working during high school because my parents joined the union then. United Farm Workers. I don't remember too much about it. Uh, when the union started, they would go and pick it every morning or something like that. I remember Caesar coming over one time when we first moved into the house. My dad comes home and he says that Caesar is coming over and so is Olores. He wants to have a meeting here. My mom says, why here? Because it's the biggest house of everybody else around here. Caesar wants to come over to have a meeting and it'll be some other people too. My mom says, well, if he's coming over, he better bring his own food because I'm not gonna feed him. She was tired. She had just come home from work. Then Caesar comes in with Helen and they're sitting around the kitchen and talking and Caesar kept looking at his watch and saying, I wonder what's keeping those people. They're taking so long. Now it was about eight o'clock. My mom says, I'm going to make something to eat. It doesn't look like anybody's showing up. Caesar says, no, 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 sit down. Talk to us, talk to me a little more. Then the doorbell rang and Caesar goes, que bien. And my dad went over to answer the door and Caesar says, no, 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 no. But my dad answers the door. And it was a surprise housewarming party that Caesar had planned. My mom was so mad. She said, look at me. You planned a party at my house and look at the way I'm dressed. Caesar and Helen had planned a surprise housewarming party for them. That was the only time I remember Caesar coming over to our house. <laughs> I'm